Hi and welcome to the board wrap up for March 2013, the Ponca City Board of Education meeting recently to discuss uh, March's events and as we get down to the final couple of months of the school year, Superintendent David Pennington is with us as we uh, talk about the, the board meeting and I do have some things I want to talk to you okay. about, Dr. Pennington, but I thought first we might go over what looked like a pretty routine agenda for the March board meeting. Yeah, it really was. I mean, it's a, uh, uh, you know, March used to be a uh, meeting with, that had a, when, when, until we changed the date of rehiring teachers, which we used to be April, April 10th, when that was moved to June, it really kind of um, turned March into a, Typically, of kind of a routine meeting, and and you know the uh, uh, so that's really it was. It was pretty quick last night. Uh, the uh, probably the the thing on there that was a little bit different was we uh, you know we had some things we had to clean up, not clean up, but because of the bond issue passed, right. there were some things that we needed to do to get ready to sell our bonds, and and we took care of those things yesterday. Absolutely, uh, you swore in a new board member as mm -hmm. well. Not a new board member, but a right. now. Uh, official, official real life board right. member, uh -huh. uh, and just to kind of remind our viewers, uh, the way whenever somebody, whenever when a board seat is vacant, which is what happened in in uh, Mr. Riley's case, and we appoint a board member, uh, they serve until the next election, and uh, and uh, and Mr. Riley uh, did not have an opponent, did not draw an opponent, and so uh, once we got past February twelfth. And the election date, really, actually, the Friday after it takes three days to certify an election, then he became a uh, a, a board member who will serve out the rest of the term that he was appointed to, which means he'll be on our board for three more years. That does remind us too. We still have a board election on April second uh, uh, for the other board seat Correct. that was up for election. We have two candidates. I remember, we had we had three candidates for that position. We have two that are left: uh, Judy Troop and Brett Colley. Uh, they will face each other in an election on April 2nd. And uh, I would just encourage our viewers to please vote. Uh, obviously, uh, anytime you have a runoff, generally there's a, there's a drop in, in the people who participated the first time around and the second time around. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I feel like a broken record. Uh, I believe our kids deserve to have a, uh, uh, our citizens participate in this election. And, and again, you know, the thing that's hard about board races is, uh, for the most part, uh, as an adult, you can look at that race and you can say, well, I don't have any kids in school. Um, or if I have kids in school, uh, that's fine, but this really doesn't affect me. All the rules are made in Washington or all made at the state legislature. But the board members do affect uh, how we, you know, I mean, we have some latitude and and what we can do with some policies, and the board members do affect those policies. And then the bottom line is our kids depend upon the adults in this community to vote in what is the best interest of students. And that's, and I think that, again, I've said this before, that's a hard thing about board races um, because sometimes we get caught up in adult issues, but what this is really about is what's best for the kids. And uh, so I hope the citizens will take the time uh, to go cast a ballot on it. The weather ought to be good, you know, sometimes in February it's cold and blowy and rainy and that kind of stuff and, and, uh, and surely we won't have any snow or ice on April 2nd. So, uh, so we ought to have good weather and people ought to be able to go participate. And nothing else, it, we don't want those poll workers to be bored. You know, sometimes you walk into these, uh, you know, small elections and I feel sorry for the people that are working at the polls. They're sitting there bored to death and so hopefully we can have a good turnout. Uh, you know, Phil, one thing I went back and did is I kind of analyze. I always go back and look at elections. And uh, anytime we have a school board race or a bond election, I get a printout of who voted. And, and just to kind of, uh, uh, just because I want to know, I want to see, or, you know, are the, are the district, are the teachers and employees participating? Um, and, uh, and just to try to see if I can pick up any trends. And I look at numbers. Uh, our turnout in, in, on the 12th was a little higher than it's been uh, for uh, the, the previous bond election we had in 2009 and in the last two board races we had. Wasn't up very much, was up a little bit. But what caught my eye is if you go back to 2007, uh, we had about, we had a little bit, we had almost a little bit more than a thousand less voters in 2012 than we had in 2007. If you go back to 2000, beyond that, 
we had about 2,000 less voters than we had in the, in the early 2000s and, and, and in the 1990s. And I think that's a, that's a trend that disturbs me. Uh, our community population is about the same. You know, so there really shouldn't be, uh, in my mind, a reason why we would have a decrease in participation. And so, uh, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to look at and see what are some things that maybe we can do as a district to try to get more people to vote. I mean, obviously we're happy with the turnout. I mean, I mean, 79% of the people who cast a ballot on the bond issue voted for the bond issue and we're excited about that and we're happy to win. So on that, in that regard, you know, we're pleased and, you know, people who study elections would argue that, that, uh, if we'd had 4,000 more people vote, we would, the numbers would have been about the same. Um, but I just think it's important, you know, and, and I, and I just think that, um, you know, there's a trend, um, out there that says that, uh, board races, the board of education, bond issues, those kinds of things don't matter anymore. And, uh, and there are, there are groups out there that are even having discussions about whether or not boards of education even matter anymore. And should we have local boards of education? Should all the, the decisions about policy and all those kinds of things, can they all make those at the state level? I think that's a dangerous trend. If you think about democracy, you think about American democracy, you know, it, and, and I know it's frustrating at times because it seems like either the state or the federal government is, is, is taking away more local prerogatives and, and that may be true, but, but the foundation of our democratic system is, uh, is local control. And, and that the government that governs best is the government that's closest to the people. And, and when, when we sit back and we say, well, I know that the bond issue is going to pass, or I know that this particular candidate is going to win the board race, and so I don't participate. It feeds, it fuels those who look at those numbers and say the public is disinterested. And so maybe, maybe we don't need this body, this democratic body anymore. And, uh, and I just, you know, I just don't know. I, I don't know that we want every education decision we make being made in Oklahoma City. Now, that they can do that. You know, we could have a system where we had a state superintendent of public instruction and, 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 and our schools operated and that person, Oklahoma City, you know, made basic big decisions for schools and you didn't have a local school board, you didn't even have a local superintendent. Um, I mean, in theory, you could do that. You could have a, you know, you, I mean, you think about some states where they have county systems and they have a superintendent that's at the county seat and each and so in our, in our situation, you would have a county superintendent in Newkirk and they would make all the decisions for the school district. And, you know, I mean, you could do that and some places do that very well. But in, in all those situations, it, it takes a little bit of that local control out. And, and the best example that I can give, and, uh, you know, you go back to my first year here and we had the discussion about Garfield. You know, if, if, if you're making that decision in Oklahoma City, then, then you close Garfield and, and you go on down the road and you don't think anything about it. Mm -hmm. But because we have a locally elected Board of Education and because they respond to the public they represent, when, that, when it came time to make that decision, there was a, an outcry of support in this community for a school on the south side of town. Now, uh, my recommendation at the time was that that would be the school that we would close. Uh, the f condition the facility was in, the site, the, the site, the fact that it was really too small of a site, in my opinion, to, to build a school two acres, a little bit small. But you know what? It was important enough to this community that the board recognized that. They voted to, to keep that school open and to, and to build a new school there. And we found a way by working with the city to give us, to kind of make the area big enough, to give us some playground area that we've created a workable situation. Um, you know, I, I sure, that, that wouldn't have happened if it was a decision made at the county level or a decision made in Oklahoma City. And so local boards are important. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I, I just hope people will take the time to vote on April 2nd.
April 2nd will be that election for Ponca City Board of Education. Uh, right now, this is a good time to talk about some of the things going on, though. You mentioned the state legislature. Uh, there's a lot of decisions, a lot of bills that could or could not affect us. And um, I've got a couple in particular that I want to talk about. Okay. But I thought maybe a good place to start would be with uh, uh, the bills concerning safety issues within our schools. And obviously, the legislature has, has taken a look at a number of different options to make sure our schools are safe. You might talk about some of those and maybe some that you're in favor of over some that maybe yeah. you're not in favor of. I think the, the you know, there's, there's basically uh, two responses that are out there right now. Uh, one response is that we need to, we need to uh, and, it, and it's kind of taken different forms. The, the form that's out there now is that it would be a local, the board would have the decision locally to decide whether or not we were going to allow teachers to carry guns in our classrooms. With some restrictions, those people have to be CLEAT certified. It's not the same CLEAT certification that police officers do. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a shorter training period, um, which I think is interesting that we're going to uh, allow people to carry guns where children are, but we're not going to require them to have the same level of training that we require for, for police officers. And So I have a little issue with that. Uh, the, other, uh, the other track that's out there uh, which is based upon the Lieutenant Governor Lamb's task force, is more of a comprehensive look. It, it talks about uh, how many drills that schools do. It, it establishes mental health training to, uh, uh, to help screen, uh, to help better identify students that maybe that have mental health issues that maybe could prove violent in the future. Uh, the establishment, reestablishment of a school, a safe, we used to have safe call where if a student or a parent saw something in their school that they felt was dangerous, maybe they didn't want to go tell a school administrator they had a phone line, they could, they could an 800 number, it was anonymous, they could make a phone call. It came back to the school administration and we addressed something. The State Department of Education dropped in the, in, when we cut funding four years ago. So, you know, those are the two approaches. Uh, you know, I don't know, obviously, uh, if the bill passes allowing uh, teachers to uh, to carry weapons that'll be a board decision um, I can tell you that my position is is that we don't want to do that I, I, I don't I don't see any value in having guns in classrooms around children I just think that's a dangerous step to take um, I think it's one of those solutions that you know on the surface it may initially appear well that's you know that's what we do we just give teachers guns and that way if somebody comes into a building well we you know we've and, and that's one of those things that, you know, sometimes that, uh, that easy solution or what appears to be an easy solution is not an easy solution. Uh, it creates, in my opinion, huge liability issues for the school district. Um, what, what's going to happen, um, maybe not today, but five years from now, when, when, you know, when we've been trained and we get lax, and we all do that. I mean, you know, we all get lax over time. And unfortunately, a teacher leaves a desk drawer open where there's a gun, a student gets, gets that gun and, and harms another student. I mean, what, and the, and the district's going to be liable for that. You know, the other, other part of this is, is what happens if the law passes and we make a decision here in Ponca City that we're not going to arm our teachers. And then something happens, an intruder comes into the building, they harm students or they harm teachers, and now we get sued because we didn't arm our kids. So it puts the district in a, really in a no-win situation. Uh, you know, we've talked to our, the, the thing I think from my perspective that you have to look at is what, are the, what do the experts say? And, uh, and you, you will not find uh, anybody in law enforcement that believes that, that it's a good idea to arm teachers. Um, you know, for the, if not if for no other reason, you know, you're creating a situation where we have an intruder. That intruder goes into a building. We call the police. The police show up. They're in that building. They're searching for that intruder. And now they don't know. I mean, right now it's pretty simple. The guy with the gun's the bad guy. Okay. But if we arm teachers, then how is a police officer to know who's the bad guy? How do they know? How do they know if that person they see in the hallway with that gun is the, is, is the bad guy or if it, whether it's a classroom teacher? 
and in and in those situations, you know, I mean, it, it they're trained to react. And what happens when you have that person who's never been in a live fire situation before? They've got their gun. They think they're protecting kids. The the police walk in and say, "Drop your weapon and get down," and that person doesn't do it fast enough. You know, you've put that police officer, you you've made them stop and think a little bit more than they should. You've put that school person in a bad situation. You know, I I just don't think we can train our people enough to to, to protect. And I, the other thing I think is that, you know, this it may. I don't know that the answer to school violence is more weapons. And that seems to be the response to everything in our country today is we just got to arm up more. Well, you know, there has to be some other solutions to, to problems. And I, look, I'm not, I'm not anti-gun. I mean, um, uh, if somebody, you know, has, has met the training and they, you know, in this state you can open carry, you can conceal carry. I mean, we're, we're, we're a state where people like their guns, and I get that, but I just think that at school um, that, that we just have to think about the, the big picture and, uh, and, and not make our decisions based upon, you know, knee-jerk reactions. And look, I get it. People are scared. You know, I mean, uh, we've had, it seems, I don't know, how many of these incidents we've had in the last 10 years, so many that we can't, and that's the sad thing, so many we can't keep track of. And we want, we want to protect our children. But the reality is, is that we live in a free and open society, and, um, and we've lived, we live in a society where we've made the decision that, that we think the ability to own a gun is protected, and, and we're willing to do that, which means we assume some risk. Whenever we make that decision that says that we're not going to restrict gun ownership or we're going to, or restrictions are going to be very minimal, that means that there's lots of guns out there, that means there's lots of ammunition out there, and there's a chance that that can fall into the hands of somebody who has bad intentions. Um, you know, I, would, I hope it doesn't, it never happens, but the reality is our kids are exposed in a lot of areas. They're in a school building. They go to bus stops. They go out on the playground. You know, we're not going to, are we going to build uh, domes over our schools? We're not going to do that. So there's lots of opportunities for people with bad intentions to do things. We have to figure out a way to be as safe as we can be to make reasonable decisions and, um, and, and you know, just to some extent just... Um, hope and pray that it never happens here. There was a task force Dr. Pennington alluded to led by Todd Lamb, uh, 22 members from various towns across the state. I don't think anybody from here was on no. it. Um, and <clears throat> at first it looked like there was going to be some meat and potatoes to it. Right. And then when they came out with it, uh, if you just read it, 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 it really was and maybe for the right reason, a little bit softer, it was a little pulled back. You know, there was a lot of talk about maybe putting more guards in mm -hmm. schools. How do you feel about that? Well, I think, again, it gets, it, there's, unfortunately, um, all those issues, um, at the end of the day, are money issues. Um, and, and I wish that wasn't true, but it is. Um, you know, we had a, 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 a very well-intentioned citizen that, that, that met with Brett Smith and I um, uh, about a week after the shootings at Sandy Hook. And, and, uh, and, you know, he had done a lot of homework, had been down and talked to Chief Bohan, and had, put to, and, and had, had calculated out uh, what it would cost us to put an armed guard in every school. And we, and we knew this already, but, but his numbers were pretty close to ours. And, and if you talk about, you know, we have... Uh, two police officers in the school district right now. We have one officer at the high school, and we have an officer that splits his time between Union and West. And if and if you if that so that's an individual that is sleep cleat certified. So we're talking about police officers. It's the best training we can give someone, um, and they are a member of the Punk City Police Department. So they're with us during the school year. In the summer, they do other things. But you know, to have somebody like that in every building in the district and to equip them and insurance and retirement and all those kinds of things, 
it cost us a million dollars a year. Well, you know, we, we don't have a million dollars to do that. Now, you multiply that across the state of Oklahoma. Uh, and again, you, you still get down to, okay, so what would that person do? Let's just pick Liberty Elementary. What would they do at Liberty Elementary? A little bit more than 300 kids. Uh, they could be there in the morning as kids come to school. They could be there when parents come in. They could be in the building. But what what is that person going to do um, for eight hours a day, 180 days a year? Uh, you know, um, my guess would be that that uh, they would have been pretty diligent uh, for the first month of January, but by today. You know, and we would. I'm sure there's some of the things we'd have them do, and and uh, but but I just don't know that that's when you sit down and look at the needs we have as a society and as a state and as a school system, that that would really be the best use of state dollars. Now, obviously, um, when something happens, you know, then yeah, you wish you would have had that guard there at that school, but. But what I would remind people is, if you go back, you know, most of the most of the decisions we make today, and the way we design our schools, and the way we do school safety, is based upon what happened at Columbine. You know, that was the first big incident. Uh, it's the one that's been studied the most. It's the one that has given us the most recommendations on what to do. Uh, it's really had a dramatic effect on school policy and the way we operate. All the bullying rules we have come out of Columbine. Because that was the initial report, is that those two young men were bullied. We we know now that that's not true, but you know sometimes once those initial decisions are made, they affect culture in such a way that they can't be changed. But if you go back and, and you read the reports on that, the first target of the two young men at Columbine was the school security officer. So whenever they made their plans, they had accounted for that individual. Um, he wasn't there that day. Uh, right after we, right after we school started after Christmas, there was a shooting in California. That school had a security guard, but that security card was delayed that day, and I don't remember now if it was because he had taken his wife to the doctor, or they may have had some weather issues. But he was late that day. So even with security guards, that's not a hundred percent guarantee that nothing is going to happen. They almost become a bullseye, don't they? They almost become a bullseye. So, uh, so I think that's one reason why the Lamb Commission didn't uh, support that. Um, I, th I think that, um, again, whether we like it or not, um, at the end of the day, um, funding money plays a big role. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're in a state right now that our school funding is 20% less than it was in 2009. So, you know, from my perspective, I'm a lot more interested in dollars that are going to go back into the classrooms than I am in additional security. And, and that may sound bad, and like, and we're, we're very interested in our kids. We want them to be safe. We train. We're going to, you know, we've got, we passed a bond issue to do some design things to our facilities to make them more secure. But if if the state legislature is going to allocate $100 million statewide for education, I want that money to go into the classroom to, to, to buy equipment, supplies, teachers, those kinds of things. That's, that's what we need to be spending money on. Um, and, you know, I also think to some extent it's, it, it's awful hard to talk about new programs when education funding is 20% less than what it was in 2009, and yet we're talking about tax cuts. So I think to some extent politics and political agendas got in the way of what the commission did. The, the thing that I would like to, that I, that I really think, you know, if, if, again, if, you know, I had King for a day and I could, what would I do? To me, if we're going to spend any new dollars, uh, they need to be in the, ish, in the area of mental health. Um, we, uh, we know more about mental health than we've ever known. Um, we've, We've cut mental health drastically in this state, even before the budget cuts hit. You know, uh, we, we've been dealing with mental health issues for a long time. Uh, we have young people that, uh, that need help. 
they're they're not bad kids, but they just need help. They need help beyond the expertise that we have, that our counselors have. Uh, I, I don't have enough uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists in this district. We have them, but I don't have enough. We're seeing uh, more behavior issues than we've ever seen. Uh, we're seeing more children that uh, that don't are, are not equipped to deal with their emotions properly. It gets in the way of learning, and I think it, it probably eventually leads to other things. You know, we don't we still don't know why the young man, and we may never know why the young man in Connecticut did what he did. Um, we don't know uh, what his disability was. We know that, that he was on an, an, on an individual education plan. We know that, he, that you know, we, there's been discussions about autism and other kind of behavioral things. But we don't know what it was. Uh, and I think that hinders us here because I think if we knew exactly what that student was dealing with, then we could look at, you know, okay, so what interventions took place for that young man and where did the system break down? You know, was it because the school district uh, wanted uh, additional testing done or assessment, did the school district uh, see some some uh, some you know some 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 behaviors that caused them to be concerned? And when they recommended uh, 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 either special placement or programming or therapy for that child, is that why mom pulled him out of school? because she disagreed with the district and so she felt like, you know, so there's lots of things that went on and we don't know the answers to that. I don't know that we'll ever know it. Um, and and so, because, you know, there, we know that the people that commit these things uh, have psychological problems. You just don't, these, you know, people who are, uh, unless they've got a psych, they're not, they don't do this stuff. So again, how do we identify those folks and then, how do we get them help? Because you know, not everybody that 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 maybe is is mentally ill, or or has a behavior issue, or has a psychological. They, not everybody does these kinds of things. So, what is it about the people that commit these kinds of atrocities? We need to be able to identify that. We need to identify them early, and we need to get them help. And and that's one of the things that's in the report of the commission. I just don't think it went far enough because. At the end of the day, um, our experience is that, that, that we will have students that, uh, that because they're going to harm themselves or harm others, that maybe for a while they go, they go to a treatment facility of some kind. But those stays in those facilities are limited because of the amount of money that is available to pay for those services. And sometimes we know that students don't really get all the help they need. They go for a short time, but they probably need to be there longer. And, and the bottom line is money gets in the way of the amount of, of mental treatment that some people need. It happens to students, it happens to adults. And I think as a country, we've got to accept that and we've got to get serious about getting these people this help, the help they need. And you know, even if we do all that, we still may have things that happen. I mean. I, don't, I wish it wasn't that way. Uh, again, I like. I wish we could guarantee. Uh, I mean, I wish I could sit here and tell every parent, "You send your kid to our school. We promise you that there's not going to be anything that happens to them uh, while they're in our building." But we can't guarantee that. Just like you can't guarantee that anywhere. You can't. You can't guarantee that at home. You can't guarantee that in your neighborhood that there's not going to be an act of violence in, that harms your child. You can't guarantee that while they're at the mall. You can't guarantee it while we're at a movie theater. We've seen, we just continue to see that places where there are large numbers of people, that those individuals that, that have a mental illness, uh, that with the, with, unfortunately, with the availability of guns, whether it's, whether it's when they, 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 they break into the, into the locked cabinet of their home, whether they're in a state that has lax laws and, and they're allowed to buy a weapon, whether they go and take it from somebody else. I mean, there's lots of ways to get a hold of those things. And if you've got somebody that's got it, that they're mentally ill enough, and that seems like the right behavior to them at that time and place, they, they, they can harm others. 
and uh, and again, so so we've got to I think have a serious discussion as a community. I think the commission kind of took the first step of doing that, but again in Oklahoma, like every other state, and really at the national level, it gets down to dollars. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pennington. That's this month's board wrap up.